Let us talk about some of the basics of light. There are many different categories and aspects. One is the physics of light and how we deal with it. The other one is the character of light, which again in our profession could be seen by its photographic aspects. And then there's also the psychological aspect to the character of light. If we want to pick any of these subjects, there will be some parts where all of these elements will come into play. And then it depends on our kind of work. For some of us, we work under conditions and in places where we're finding light. And just simply have to augment the light that we find and modify it slightly. This may not necessarily be limited to the run and gun, fast shooting and the work in the small team. Sometimes we will find light that has an incredible beauty and we don't want to destroy that and simply think where and for what purpose the light that we find needs just a little help in order to direct the attention of our viewers to the person in front of the camera or to a particular object or to create and enhance the feeling of space depth and three-dimensionality. So this also can be a very refined level of work. The other approach is where we are creating the light in an endless variety of ways, moods and purposes. And then, of course, we can never forget to talk about the brother of light, the shadow. And if in our profession we talk about the transport of emotions, then we will find that sometimes the shadows may play an even more important part in creating moods and emotions. And then there are the transitions between light and shadow. Again, that plays a very important role. Hard light, hard shadows, or very gentle transitions and even transparent shadows. We will attempt to cover some of these subjects in other videos. Today, let's talk about some of the physical aspects and how they influence our images and scenes. One of these aspects of physics is called the inverse square law. Putting it in a simple way, and if we're talking about a point light source or Fresnel lights, focusing lights, then the general rule can be stated as follows. Double the distance and you have one quarter of the light. This can be visualized relatively easily when we're thinking of a point light source and at one meter distance we think of lighting one square meter. At two meter distance, double the distance, we're now lighting four such squares, four times the area. Thus it is easy to understand that at double the distance we have only one quarter of the light level. Now this can pose some challenges when we're lighting a moving subject and the resulting change of intensity may not provide always a natural look. In some other situations, we may be using several light sources. For key light, fill light, backlight, and when now our subject is moving, this will inevitably change the balance. Thus, it may make it much more difficult later on to match the images to edit them. One way to overcome such effects, or minimize them at least, in other words, a way to cheat the square law, may be to place the light fixtures as far away as possible. 
Now for this, the focusing dado lights are eminently suitable because they focus better than anything else comparable. And they excel in having very far reach and high intensity over distance. Furthermore, they are very controllable and their beam of light is extremely clean, perfectly even and smooth within the beam, but no stray light outside the beam. Thus, you can use dado lights over bigger distances better than you may be able to do with any other light fixtures. Lighting indoors, there may be limitations as to how far away you can place the light fixtures. Here, you can think of using a hard reflector that works like a mirror. Since the dado light can spot down to 4 degrees, you can adjust easily to the size of the mirror and reflecting the light from such a hard mirror-like reflector, you keep the original character of the beam of light, but you are creating a virtual light source, maybe at double the distance. Adding the distance of the light fixture to the reflector or mirror, and the distance of the reflector to your subject. Thus, you minimize the effect of the square law. This can be easy to apply in everyday lighting, because hard reflectors are quite commonly available. In some other videos, we are talking about a much deeper exploration of reflected light with the Cinema Reflect Lighting System, where such procedures are a major part of the entire lighting setup enhanced by using a great variety of reflector surfaces, creating different characters and angles of light. This, however, would lead us much too far away from today's subject. So, another example. You try to light a larger room with a low ceiling. Here you attach some plastic mirrors to the ceiling, put the data lights on the floor, shine them into the plastic mirror reflectors and you've doubled the height of the room. And again, you've been able to cheat the square law. The square law, as described so far, may prove to be perfectly applicable for point light sources or most of our focusing light fixtures that we use. But it may not hold true for some different conditions and situations. Number one, lighting from close proximity. Here, the size and the diameter of the front lens may start showing influence. And you may find that with a small angle of exit near the spot position, these calculations and measurements will not relate to the distance from the front lens or not even to the actual light source within the fixture, but to a virtual light source which may have to be imagined behind the light fixture. If you want to explore these subjects deeply, they may go into mathematics and formulas that the practitioner may not be familiar with. In order not to make this too confusing, we will put together some of these thoughts and formulas in a website for those who want to go into it deeply and more scientifically. Number two, the closer you get to a parallel beam, the square law, as we've understood it this far, may apply less and less when we're looking at the position of the light fixture. The explanation may again lie in the virtual light source which will move further and further back behind the light fixture when we come close to a parallel beam. Now, for some users, it may be of interest that we have developed a parallel beam optical attachment which fits the front of the classic data light and the series 200 metal halide lights as well as everything of our series 400 in metal halide 
or halogen. This optical attachment creates a near parallel beam. <coughs> Amazingly enough, it works when you put the light head in the flood position or near the full flood position. The other surprising fact is that with this parallel beam optics in front, you will double the light output in comparison to the narrowest spot setting that can be achieved with the dado light. We already know that the dado light can spot extremely tight, but then with this attachment, we can surpass the light output of our lights in the spot position and actually double the light output with this parallel beam, which still, by focusing the light head, can be modified slightly in its exit angle. Now, what could be the possible uses of this parallel beam attachment? High light intensity over a large distance. Significantly less influence of the square law, less fall off, and less heat. Now we can go even one step further by adding a highly efficient heat reflecting filter in front of the parallel beam attachment. And in order to further minimize parasitic light exiting or any disturbance towards the camera lens, a honeycomb attachment can be placed in front of the parallel beam attachment. Our focusing lights, the classic ones, just as well as the Series 400, together with the parallel beam attachment, become an integral part of the cinema reflect lighting system, which here we don't want to describe in detail. But if such subjects are interesting for you, please look at our videos like the River of Light, and Jakob Ballinger's explanation that we filmed during our last international agent meeting. Large area sources or large reflecting areas. Here, a completely different interpretation of the square law will apply. Placing our subject in close proximity to a very large light source or a large reflecting area Increasing the distance to the light source or reflecting area will not show any significant drop in light intensity. One possible explanation can be seen where very close to the light source, the subject is lit by a small part of the large light source, and when increasing the distance, a larger diameter of the light source, respectively the reflective surface, will become active. Thus, it appears that in close proximity, the square law will not apply at all, and even when increasing the distance to our subject, the square law will apply with lesser significance. Example. Let's look at our very large Panaura 7 soft light, with a diameter of over 2 meters. If to start with, we place our object at a distance of 1 meter, and then increase the distance to 2 meters. The decrease of light level, according to our understanding of the square law, should be 75%. But, in this case, it proves to be less than 40%. Now, if we now further double the distance from 2 meters to 4 meters, the decrease of light intensity, again, will not be 75%, but only approximately 30%. Only once we reach a distance that is further than five times the size or diameter of the light source, will the square law, as we originally understood it, start applying again. A soft light, even the Panaura 7 soft light with its uniquely different character, will only show its true wraparound character when used at a distance which does not really exceed more than two or three times the diameter of the light fixture itself. To take it to another extreme, look at the Sun, which has a diameter many times larger than the Earth. 
but because it is very far away, it creates hard shadows and acts like a point light source. The Sun has a diameter of nearly 1.4 million kilometers, but the small Earth can only offer 12,800 kilometers. In other words, if you place a soft light very far away, its wraparound character diminishes and it starts acting like a hard light source. Now there's some further tricks to cheat the square law in our normal working day. Scrims. Scrims are wire nets which exist in different densities, one half, full and double. Some of these are also cut in half, so that one half is open, the other half is covered by the net. When you use a focusing light in downward tilted position and your talent comes closer to the light, the intensity will rise drastically. Here the half scrim can help to minimize the intensity at closer distance. Another kind of scrim is called graduated scrim with three steps of intensity and that may work even a little bit better. The most elegant way in my mind is our graduated gray filter. Every cameraman is familiar with such filters to be used on the camera because the sky often is a lot brighter than desired. For lights, the same physics apply, but so far, we're the only ones who offer graduated gray filters for our lights. Maybe because they're not so easy to manufacture, or maybe because nobody has thought about it. That would be hard to imagine. For museums, we go even one step further. We're the only ones who have patented and are building focusing lights with asymmetric light distribution. Large paintings lit with our asymmetric lights will not receive more light on the top, whereas a habit painters usually place the sky. Just a few aspects concerning light and the square law. In our other videos, we will try and go deeper into the character of light and the spectral characteristics. So thank you for now. I'm Dado.